Hello, I want to welcome you all to the Berkeley Haas Speaker Series, New Thinking in a Pandemic, Business, Economics, and Inclusion. I'm Laura Tyson. I am a distinguished professor of the Graduate School at the University of California, Berkeley, and I've also been the Dean of the Berkeley Haas School of Business. I'm currently co-chairing Governor Newsom's uh, Council of Economic Advisors, and the only reason I mention that is to make sure that I am that you know I'm speaking only for myself, not for the governor, not for the council. I am thrilled, personally thrilled, today to welcome Jesse Rothstein. Jesse is a professor of economics and public policy at UC Berkeley. He is also the director of UC Berkeley's uh, California Policy Lab, and we definitely want to know what that is and, and what he's finding out for us. Jesse also served in the Obama administration uh, at the Council of Economic Advisors and then a chief economist at the Department of Labor. Uh, he will be uh, making a presentation, a short presentation, where he'll show us some of the real-time data he has been collecting uh, on the state of the labor market in California. Uh, we'll also talk about it at the state of the nation, and then we'll talk about some policy uh, implications and responses. So, Jesse, thank you so much for taking some time to join the, the Berkeley Haas and UC Berkeley community, and we really look forward to your insights to try to understand the very, very deep hit on the labor market from this pandemic recession. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you very much for having me. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm going to share some slides because I, I'm an economist. I can't do anything without graphs. So I'm going to share some slides and let's get that going. Uh, and then I will talk through what, what I've been seeing. Um, okay, so my slides should be shared now. And I've got a few graphs. Uh, these are drawing on a, a number of different data sources. Uh, the traditional data that we use to usually use to understand the labor market just isn't high frequency enough to understand what's been going on the last few months. Between one monthly survey and the next monthly survey, the economy changed 180 degrees and then changed back again the next month. And so we've needed just much higher frequency data. I'm going to be talking about uh, two different data sources that, that we've been drawing on at the California Policy Lab. One is uh, data from a firm called Homebase, which uh, administers payroll systems for, for small businesses, mostly for hourly workers. You can see when every worker clocks in and clocks out each day, and so you can count the number of workers who are working on each day. These are businesses that are in the sectors that have been the hardest hit by this, by this crisis, the retail, uh, food and drink, uh, small health clubs, things like that. And so it's a really good, good window into what's been going on in that sector and, what, and, and how bad it has been. The other source we'll be using is California unemployment insurance claims. Through the Policy Lab, we've developed a partnership with the California Employment Development Department, which administers the unemployment insurance system. And some of my colleagues at CPL down at UCLA have been working with those data to really understand who is, who is it that's, that's drawing on unemployment insurance benefits uh, these days. Uh, so let me just start with the broad overview. This is just the traditional measure of employment, the employment to population ratio is the share of everybody who's working. Um, and you can see that that goes down in recessions and comes up in recoveries. But all of those other recessions that we thought were the greatest cataclysms ever barely show up here once you put, once you put 2020 on there. The, the collapse we had in April, or in late March and early April, was about twice the size of the entire job loss in the, in the Great Recession. Uh, so it's been an enormous job loss. We lost, you can think of 10% of the population went from working to not working in, in a month. We've had a small recovery since then, but uh, we're still down well below the, the bottom of the Great Recession. In California alone, we lost two and a half million jobs or 14 and a half percent of, of jobs in just in, that, in, a, in a month and a half. Um, this is another way of putting that in perspective. This is uh, taken from a colleague who put all the different recessions we've had since World War II and showed them by how many jobs were lost relative to the peak and then how long it took to recover. And you can see the Great Recession is that dark blue line was really notable for how long it took us to recover and for how deep it was, deeper than any other post-war recession. But again, this, this current uh, downturn is two or three times worse. And while we have had a fair amount of recovery since, the, since April, it's still well below the worst of the Great Recession. Now, the recovery has been much faster than the Great Recession was. 
And so if we can maintain that pace, I think we are, you know, there's a good chance that it won't last the full six years that the Great Recession lasted before we before we started to come back. But I think it's it's probably not the case that we will maintain this pace. A lot of those jobs that came back in the first month or two are ones where the business had to shut down for a little while, reorganize, put up sneeze barriers and other things, and then was able to reopen. But increasingly, we're seeing the businesses that haven't yet reopened are saying they probably not, aren't going to be able to. And so increasingly, workers who were saying that they were on temporary layoff are now saying that their, their job is gone for good. So I, I expect that we will see, we're already seeing the last couple of months have been some, some stagnation. But that even even after that, the, the the virus is under control. I expect we'll see a slower uh, slog back to, to full employment uh, after this. Um, now, the the flip side of employment is unemployment, and so this shows the the unemployment rate. It spiked up to fourteen point seven percent in April. Uh, it then has again come back down in the last few months, down to ten point two percent. Um, that's, that's still higher than the highest we ever saw in the Great Recession. And that was just one month in the Great Recession. We've now had several months of this. And uh, I, think, I think, again, it's going to last for quite a while. Now, importantly, that 14.7% we had in April is really understating how bad it was. Because there were a number of reasons why the surveys we have that are designed to measure unemployment they weren't really set up to, to capture this idea of people who had jobs and were willing to work, but couldn't go to work because the county health officials told them not to. And so there were a bunch of people who were, who were categorized as employed, but not at work, who the Bureau of Labor Statistics says they probably should have been counted as unemployed. And if you start to count them, you get into the 20s for the unemployment rate in April. Again, that's come down, but it's still historically high. So we've got a really, really uh, severe crisis. Uh, this is a very different crisis than any past recessions. What I've shown here is the job losses from peak to trough in the Great Recession and in the current crisis separately by industry. The Great Recession, like most recessions before it, was led by construction and manufacturing. And so people often talk about man sessions because the sectors that, that tend to be hardest hit by recessions are ones that are disproportionately male. This recession was not a construction or manufacturing recession. It was led by the leisure and hospitality sector and other services. All sorts of services that involve personal contact that you just, just couldn't do if everybody needed to be careful, uh, careful about their um, exposure to, to other people. So it's very different. In the leisure and hospitality, we lost basically half of jobs yeah. in, in a couple of months. So really, again, out of proportion to anything we've ever seen before. Um, another, the, now turning to the unemployment data that, we, that I've been drawing on, the unemployment claims. We, in California, a third of workers have filed unemployment claims during this crisis. Uh, a third of everybody who's covered by the system has filed claims. Some of more women than men, again, consistent with this being a services-led recession. Much more heavily young people who are most likely to work in these kind of personal interaction jobs than older workers. So half of 20 to 24 year olds uh, who were working have filed unemployment claims and, and huge uh, disproportionality across race and ethnic group as well. Black workers are much more likely than white workers to have filed claims. This is a crisis that is hitting the people who are already the most vulnerable in our society. They were the lowest wage jobs are the ones that, that are, have been basically shut down. So what have we done? Um, I think the policy response, you can think of there being two pieces. One, the first part, thing you want to talk about about the policy response is the public health response. What did we do to get the virus under control? And everybody knows that we shut down. We told everybody to stay home. I'm not, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but I think that it's become very clear that we completely bungled the rest of the, of the public health response. That we needed to use that shutdown to get testing measures and tracing measures and other things in place that would make it possible to get the virus under control and allow us to, to reopen. And we really didn't do that. And that's why we're seeing things closing again afterward. But in contrast to bung bungling the public health response, I think initially we did a pretty good job with the economic response. We basically took the approach that there was no one measure that was going to reach everybody who needed help. So we're gonna try a whole bunch of different things and hope that some of them, that one of them reaches everybody who needs it. So there was a program that provided uh, forgivable loans to small employers 
to help keep workers on the job. This was the page, payroll protection program um, or the paycheck protection program. Uh, there were there were other programs designed to provide aid to larger employers. Uh, there were uh, dramatic expansions of the of the um, unemployment insurance claim program that we basically added six hundred dollars to everybody's weekly unemployment benefit, and that enabled um, people to, to hopefully pay their bills while they were out of work. We also created a new program for people who weren't already covered by unemployment insurance. We, we provided $1,200 checks to people, to everybody who filed taxes last year. And we did a little bit to provide aid to state and local governments, but I think that's gonna be an area that we really maybe should have done a lot more of and certainly need to now. Let, Let me talk, talk briefly, briefly about, about the unemployment claims, claims because I think that's, that's been a little focus of a lot of attention. attention. We, we provided a $600, $600 top-up to unemployment benefits. Now, now unemployment, unemployment benefits are designed, designed not to be very generous. generous. The, the, the typical, typical worker gets the median payment in California, California was about $314 uh, prior, prior to this. this. So when you add $600, that goes to $914. That's, that's about half of median family, family income. income. So it's so just, just over the threshold that counts as very low income. So this, this is, is enough you could maybe imagine getting by, but it's certainly not enough to make you rich. And then the important thing to know is that those benefits ran out in July. So that we're back down to the $314. That means there are millions of families are having dramatically cut back on their on their spending in the last few weeks. And they're really, really at risk of being evicted and other things. There have been a number of evaluations of trying to understand whether that six hundred dollars made people unwilling to go back to work. And there's a the traditional way we think about that benefits is that if they're too generous, people aren't eager to go back to work. On the other hand, right now, it's, it's not, not clear that the problem, problem is that people don't want to work. More of the problem seems to be that there are jobs, jobs that it's not safe, safe to work. And in, in fact, there are a number of studies that try to tease this out. out. It, it looks like if you look at the states, states that had the most generous, generous benefits, benefits, those states, states had, the, had the smallest declines in employment, employment and, and the fastest, fastest recoveries, recoveries, which is the opposite of what you'd expect if this is really, really holding us back. It seems like the more important feature is that these benefits are helping families pay the bills there's that, that money, money gets sent to the local economy and it helps to create jobs, jobs for others. So then, so then let me stop by kind of thinking about how to think about policies going forward, forward, forward and then I'll wrap up. I, I think, think that there being there being kind of three, three phases, phases of the response. The, the shortest term thing is we've got to get the virus under control, we've got to get the public health measures in place, and we really haven't done a good job yet. And while we're doing that, we have to keep families afloat. It does no good any good that families are going to bankrupt by the millions during this period. Just, just because you're wild, 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 it's just, just not safe for anybody to work. In the medium term, term, I think our priority needs to be how do we keep businesses alive? How do we bring them back once we're already there? Many, Many businesses are going to be gone for good, but the recovery will be, the recovery will be a lot slower if we need to create new businesses that take place all at once and close during the pandemic. So we really want to try to bring them back. And then in the longer term, I think we have to think that this is what is quickly turning into a serious traditional recession. And the biggest problem is. Um, is really going to be a shortage of aggregate demand. That there's just not going to be enough money being spent, and that's going to that's going to limit businesses' ability to survive. So if we want the business to survive, we need to make sure there are, there are, they have customers, and that means making sure people have money to spend. The biggest concern I think in in this area in my book is state and local governments. State and local governments face balanced budget requirements. They have to pay. They have to have. They can't spend any more than they raise in taxes, and their taxes were just decimated by this crisis. And so they've, they, they've got really big holes between revenues and, and planned expenditures. They've been mostly holding on, hoping the federal government gets its act together and, and, and provides a, a stimulus package. But if it doesn't happen, then we're gonna see massive layoffs in the public sector. Those workers will then stop spending and that will hurt, hurt the private sector as well. On top of that, we really need the public sector more than ever right now. That public health response that's the most important priority requires lots of public workers. So does opening schools and anything like an acceptable uh, sector level of quality. It's going to require a lot more workers than it usually does, not fewer. But we're looking at 20% larger uh, cuts in staffing in, throughout, throughout local and state government. And that's going to be a disaster for us. So that's my broad overview. And I think I will stop here and we will uh, turn it over to more of a conversation. Thanks a lot. Fantastic, Jesse. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start right where you uh, left off. So we, we've had uh, the president come out with an executive order on unemployment compensation. So my first question would be, are we solving the problem 
which the Congress is, seems unable to solve through that executive order. So what, what can, can a president actually do unemployment compensation outside of the system we currently have? Yeah, so the, the short answer is nobody really knows what this executive order is. Okay. And one day last week, we heard from the, from the executive branch four or five different interpretations of what that executive order did. Nobody quite knows what it is. And the reason is that the, the president doesn't actually have the authority to create new unemployment insurance programs. And so he's trying to stretch his authority. He's taking money out of, out of FEMA funds that are meant to help hurricane victims and claiming it's going to be used for unemployment insurance. There are all sorts of requirements that come with that that he has to figure out how to meet. And so there's this question about whether states have to match it or not, or what counts as a match, or who will be eligible. None of this is really resolved. Even if states can figure out how to figure out how to participate, for one thing, this is a pretty substantial reduction in payments from what we've had what we had under the CARES Act through July. Depending on which interpretation of the executive order you believe, it's either a one third or one half reduction of the of that those payments. On top of that, it's going to require a huge amount of work from states that are already really struggling to keep their unemployment insurance work systems working with uh, many more claims than they've ever been designed for in the past. It's going to take weeks or months for them to get the to to rebuild those systems to be able to process these payments. Including and the amount of money is only enough to pay about three or four weeks of benefits anyway. So by the time the first payment goes out, it'll all be done. Well, yeah. And including uh, the state of California has had some, I mean, the administrative burden on the states from running the unemployment system at this level, a level that was not anticipated, has been overwhelming, has been overwhelming. And if you, I think you were, you were in the Obama administration during the, the rebuild out, one of the reasons that it was such a slow process was that state and local governments were reeling. They could not, they didn't get uh, the federal aid they needed. Uh, so one of the things they did was to not invest enough in their unemployment insurance administration. So we entered this, uh, this recession with underinvestment by the states because they had budgets which didn't allow them to make the investments. It's, <laughs> Exactly. Uh, I worry about that, that beautiful chart you have where you show the numbers coming up sharply, but I'm afraid they're going to come up and then they're going to get stuck on that low uh, paced recovery line because we didn't provide adequate support for state and local governments. <laughs> I think that's right. The, most, the scenario that seems most likely to me, but one of the more worrisome ones is the, check, is the square root recession. Mm -hmm. We went down, we come back up, and then we're then we're really going to be stagnating for a long time. Stagnating, stagnating for a long time, stagnating for a yeah. long time. Um, it's uh, the case that um, in the unemployment system, uh, you mentioned uh, that there is a view uh, among some economists that maybe the six hundred dollars going forward is too generous as a disincentive to work and then there are a lot of economists who say nonsense there's not enough jobs that's not what's keeping people from working um where do you, you clearly you come down on the evidence that it's not too generous as a disincentive to work there are some economists who don't believe that i i, I recently went to the University of Chicago, uh, you know, where they sort of ask economists questions. And it was amazing the percentage of economists who actually thought, yeah, it's probably too generous to keep the 600 because it will discourage people from going back to work. Why should we be giving people more than the pay they would get at work? Why, why should we do that? So what do you, what, how do you answer that? I mean, we want people to be able to, to survive during this period, and that's the first order of concern right now, is we want, we want to keep families afloat during a period when there aren't, they can't work and there aren't enough jobs to go around even if they could work. So and what about just increasing then the income, the direct cash payments to households? Don't link it to the unemployment. Uh, just say here, we, we, need to get you, we need to get more purchasing power in the economy. Let's not do it through UI. Let's do it through cash handouts. You have think, a kind of temporary UBI, a temporary universal basic income. Yeah. I think we should be mixing and matching and we should be trying lots of different things because no one thing is going to reach everybody. But the drawback to the temporary cash payments is they go to people who, whose jobs have been just fine and to people who haven't. Yeah. If you look at people with college degrees, they mostly haven't been that badly hurt and they've mostly recovered. And, that, and giving them those cash payments is 
it's fine. They'll spend some of it, but they'll save some of it. They're very untargeted. Yes, the, yeah. the, the evidence actually suggests that it's spent most at lower income levels and at upper income levels, it's being saved more. I mean, people are afraid to go out. They're afraid to take trips. They're afraid to go to fancy restaurants or buy fancy clothing. So they take that cash and just save it, put it away. Exactly. exactly. But if you're a, a restaurant worker or a retail worker, that, the, that, those unemployment benefits are the difference between you paying rent and not or buying groceries or not. Okay. And so we've seen record lines of food pantries, things like that. And that's where the money will, every penny will be spent very quickly if we can get it to people. Now, there, if you had time and then Congress was able to pass something more than a week ahead of time of when it was needed, maybe you would design something where you would keep some of that when you go back to work to try to kind of smooth the, the transition back to work. But if, in, the, in the urgency of doing something immediately, the $600 was the right thing, way to do it. Just make sure that we get money to people fat first and work out the details later. Uh, there have been some proposals that you start with the 600, but then you gradually move it as the unemployment rate changes. So you, you, you write into the legislation that the amount is sensitive to the unemployment rate. Yes, I think, those, I think that's the right direction to move. But the, there were proposals to do that a few months ago. Yes. If we had no, we, we knew for months that this cliff was coming in the end of July, yes. that we were seeing bills in early May right. to fix this in June. Right. If we passed those bills then, we could have designed a kind of gradual transition. Right now, we fell off the cliff and the, we need to get back on it. And then we can start to think about how to, how to design a transition out of it. So on, on the debates in Washington about this, besides the debate we've already talked about, which is, you know, is it a disincentive to work if you make it too generous? There is the now concern that, oh, the federal government just cannot afford this. Let's leave the states aside for a minute because they may literally not be able to afford it. But what do you think of that argument that um, we cannot come up with this kind of stimulus at this level because it just will indebt the federal government too much? So the first answer is the federal government can absolutely afford this. Uh, right now, interest rates are at record lows. People are desperate to find places to lend their money to, and they would love to lend it to the U.S. government. Um, in general, I'm not a huge fan of, of kind of thinking about the federal government's budget as like a household budget. But in this case, I think the analogy actually works. If you were a job and you broke your leg and you couldn't work for a few months, there, your choices were, OK, I'm not going to have any income for a couple of months. I'm just going to stop eating or I'm going to put money on my credit cards, pay the bills and realize that I'm going to be worse off down the road and I have to pay those bills off. But that's better than not eating for, for these two months. Obviously, you borrow from the future to finance your consumption today. And that's what we need to be doing today. It's a shame that this has happened. It's terrible. We're poorer, for, poorer now than we would have been if this hadn't happened. But given that it's happened, we're much better off keeping ourselves afloat during this period taking on some debt to do it and realizing that we'll pay it off in the future. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree, but, but it's clearly a, uh, a uh, it's an increasing uh, debate issue. What's not a debate issue, by the way, and this is where I've been struck by, so some things economists have really strong unanimity on. And, and one of the things right now that seems to be uh, very much across the, the political divide within economics is the importance of, it, of aid for state and local governments. There, there's just a kind of, we can't, um, the essential services, the number of public employees that are at risk now if the state cannot uh, afford to employ them, there is a general view that this is the most important thing. And yet it looks like it's the least likely thing to be included in the package if there's a, another package passed. Right. It's always easier to keep existing jobs than it is to create new ones. Mm -hmm. And by passing up the opportunity to keep the, keep the state and local governments afloat, we're passing up the opportunity to save the jobs that we really need to be saving right now. Yeah. And then just, we're just making it harder for ourselves. And there's really no, there's no excuse for not doing this. Yeah. Uh, again, the politics. Um, I was on an interesting uh, call this morning. You, you pointed out, and I think it really is important to underscore that the sectoral incidence of the employment hit has been very different, okay? So you don't see it so much in manufacturing, but you see it dramatically in hospitality and leisure. One of the things we were talking about this morning is in the state of California, where we still have much stricter 
requirements than most other states, most other states now, in terms of, I would say, personal services, uh, hair salons, nail salons, spas, uh, you know, gyms, things like that. Uh, that we're, it's now so long that there be, that more and more of these are gonna go bankrupt. It's, it's, the, it's the length of the close down that, that is really now a very serious issue. Do you see that? Or are you seeing that in your numbers as well? Yeah, I think it's a huge problem. You're seeing increasingly businesses that thought they were gonna be closed temporarily, they, they, they're now saying it's not gonna happen. Okay. Partly, I think some of them thought they could reopen once and then they reopened and then had to close down again. And that was just another big hit on their finances. Partly we had that paycheck protection program, which was designed to keep small businesses afloat, but that provided eight weeks of funding. Yeah. Eight weeks is long since come and gone. And so the, we needed to renew that. And the fact that we just, that we, Congress, again, they did, they did what they needed to do. They passed something very quickly in late March, March 27th. They, they didn't spend a lot of time getting it all perfect. They passed something, got the money out the door, but they needed to come back the next month and pass another one to, to start to smooth out those edges. And they never did. That was the last we heard from them. And that's, that's left us in a lot of trouble. Is there anything that, so you do a lot of work, obviously, with the state. Is there anything, and I'm working for the governor, but said not speaking for him. Right. What, what are the lessons for the state here? Are there things the state is trying to do that it's doing more efficiently? Um, what about short time compensation? What about trying to encourage employers in the state to work, to get their employees to work, you know, 75% of the time and have UI for the other 25%. What, are, what, what can the state do? And is the state doing enough uh, to try to deal with this problem? So what you mentioned with this program called short-time compensation, or um, it's, this, it, as you said, if an employer is facing layoffs and they say, okay, well, instead of laying off a third of our workers, we'll cut everybody's worker, everybody's hours by a third, then they can go on unemployment insurance for the other for that third. The workers are sometimes better off than they would have been working, and the kind of employer can stay afloat without job losses. On top of that, the state under the current rules, the federal government covers the cost of that unemployment insurance. So that, that helps the state budget as well. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's an option that's available. We haven't done a great job of taking advantage of it. We're trying. This is one of the things that happens when you're when you come into this unprepared. And we, you mentioned the, the, a few minutes ago that the unemployment insurance systems, they're really held together with kind of tape and wire at this point. Right. They were built in the 80s. They, they're on antiquated computer systems. They then got hit with this historic flood of claims, many, many more than they've ever faced before. And they just don't have the bandwidth to be able to do anything more than that, more than just try to keep up with those claims. And they're weeks behind on many of the claims. It's a shame. I think that, I think the biggest kind of lost opportunity for, for the state right now is that short-time compensation. But as so far I've, as I can tell, it's not happening. I've heard, Jesse, and it may be apocryphal, it's probably, probably worth something for you to look into, that um, let's think about the, the percentage, the large number of public sector employees in state universities, community colleges, and the University of California. I have heard that uh, the idea of short-term compensation there, even there, where some people are going to be threatened with furloughs and some people are going to be threatened with layoffs, and yet these big employers are resisting short-time compensation. I, I just don't even begin to understand that. But I don't either. I, we can try to lead the university higher education <laughs> into uh, this very sensible thing to do. So, um, the yeah. state of Michigan announced a couple of months ago that they were going to do that. They were going to use the short term compensation program to help them balance their budget without without laying workers off. They did. Oh, okay. we, should, we should be doing the same. Yeah, um, we should absolutely be doing the same. And we're, we're talking more about things like, can we uh, reorient state procurement so we actually you know do procurement from small businesses to try to keep them going we're, we're talking about it but, but that way whereas this would be a kind of scale way of, of doing it it strikes me so yeah there is an interesting thing the the way you find out about how a program works like this is you get journalists to, to look into it and it turned out that the la times and slate both had to had to use had to announce layoffs, and they both went with short term compensation, and so that means there are a bunch of journalists who have a really strong interest in figuring out how that, how, how this works, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't work very well. It's a really hard program to use. There are lots of hurdles. 
it's you know it's better than not using it but we really need to do a lot more to make this a per, an easier program to use so yeah so one of the proposals at the federal level so you know there have been these proposals that have gone into the congress is to actually try to uh, reform the short-term compensation short time compensation over the longer term that that's a reform that would have to go into the unemployment legislation at the federal level, and then you could work. But let me give you a more radical proposal. Uh, okay. The two Emanuel brothers, Rob and Ezekiel, have proposed that essentially what we should do is Medicaid should become totally a federal program, mm -hmm. and UI should become totally a federal program to standardize benefits, standardize terms, standardize uh, the sensitivity, the unemployment rate, everything, just standard and administer, take on the cost, and then states should do other things. So what, what do you think? You know, the state version, the reason we have a federal state unemployment system is partly because the states, particularly states that wanted um, small federal government, basically argued against having a federal program. And so, um, is it now time to not say we just have a national program as many other countries do? I'm very sympathetic to that argument. I think I think we should be thinking very hard about about whether about doing that. And I think there are two different parts of it that you could potentially do separately. You could federalize the administration, but allow states to set the benefit levels. Okay. Or you could federalize the benefit levels and let states administer it. It okay. seems to me the thing we really need to do is federalize the administration. Um, I think there's some concern that the states that don't like the program would then make the benefits too stingy for the for the rest of us. And so I, you may want to have some state flexibility, but I also think that it's in all of our interest to have more generous benefits. Uh, so you and so could federalize think, the administration and maybe set minimums on the benefits. So give the, because la local labor markets are really different. And so the benefit level is appropriately something you want to re be responsive to the local labor market. That, make, right. that makes sense to me. Right. Sense. There is this free riding game that happens in many recessions where the federal government comes in with expansions of benefits that, that make that help help to make it more appropriate for the recession. And states figure out ways to tweak their programs to move more people off of the state program and onto the federal program. And so some minimum benefit levels and standards like that would, would go a long way towards towards reducing that. So could we talk a little bit in the few remaining minutes about the quality of the jobs that people may go back to? Because it, not only has this, uh, this recession been very different in terms of sectoral impact, but we see you saw your numbers in terms of race, in terms of gender, in terms of age. But basically, it's the low wage segments of the population that have been hit the hardest. And nonetheless, I think David Otor pointed out, we have this ironic situation right now is we have too few bad jobs. We, we have too few bad jobs. We want, to, we want more bad jobs to get people back into them. Right. But longer term, what do we do to try to uh, create better job opportunities going forward? I know that's a really big question and it's a little bit of an unfair question, but um, I just, think as we're trying to get people back to work, what can we do with the with that work to make it better from the point of view of the person who's holding that job? Right. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't call it as we have too few bad jobs. I would say we have too few jobs. We need more jobs <laughs> and any job will do at this point. Yeah. Yeah. But I think in the long run, we do need to think about how do we figure, how do we make these jobs better jobs? We are always going to need restaurant workers. We're always going to need people to change sheets in hotels. We're always going to need uh, need a number of these jobs that don't require a college degree and that have historically paid very poorly. And I think the challenge is going to be if we it is how do we make those better jobs? And that's a combination of policies. I think that's uh, the minimum wage has made many of those jobs better in California in the last few years. And I think we can do more along those lines. But we also do things like supplementing the salary and those jobs through the earned income tax credit. Right. And we could do more to expand that. I think mm -hmm. I think we want to, but that's the challenge. How do we make those better jobs? I don't, I think often we've gotten distracted and think and thought, well, we just need to create more jobs for college graduates and that will that will make better jobs. But we still are gonna need people to wait tables and to yeah. to work in hotels. And so we there need are to always going to be those personal service jobs. So the question is how to make them 
better. And some of it is better that you put around them. Some of it is, as you say, minimum wage, I agree, very important, earned income tax credit, very, very important. Um, let me uh, talk a little bit, again, it's a little bit off, but I think you see it in the numbers, um, about the small business connection here, because a lot of these jobs are also in small businesses, and the small businesses cannot they would say, afford to offer the kind of benefits. I mean, there's a benefit proposal now floating around the legislature about uh, paid uh, sick leave and, and unpaid extended leave. And, you know, a small business saying, wait a minute, I can't, I got five people who work for me. If I have to do this, we close down, we're done, we're done. Um, so how do you uh, balance this issue of, what do we do for the small businesses and employment, I guess is what I would say. Yeah. Uh, so we've definitely seen the small businesses have been hit much harder than larger businesses during this period. Mm -hmm. they, when, when it looked like this was going to be a three-week uh, shutdown, I think small, large businesses said, okay, well, we can eat this. It's, it's painful, but we'll be able to eat this. We'll keep people on and we'll, we'll come back ready. But small businesses didn't have the money to do that. And so they, they had much more layoffs and much, harder, much less ability to kind of stay open during this period. I think the kind of paycheck protection program style approach of giving loans to businesses to be able to keep paying their workers was the right approach. And you see that in a lot of European countries and other, other countries around the world, they've done that more of their policy response has been of that form of let's give money to employers to keep workers on the payroll, to keep, to keep people in place That's during this period. Right. We didn't really have the infrastructure in place to be able to do that very well. And so we could do it a little bit, but we knew that many, many people would get, would get missed through that. And there were lots of problems with the rollout of the Paycheck Protection Program because it had to go through special loans that were set up that there wasn't any precedent for. It was just hard to do quickly. Yes. But, um, but I think that's the right approach is to try to do more to support businesses by giving them money to support the payroll. Mm -hmm. There is a, a federal, so the payroll protection plan, as far as I, last time I looked, most of the money had been spent, but there still were, billions of dollars that had not been taken out. Um, yeah. But there's a, a much larger Main Street uh, lending program from the Federal Reserve, um, right. which is also not being used very ag aggressively. So I, I don't know, that that's telling me that maybe for a firm, I think their, their, their numbers are much bigger. They're like 500 employees or something like that. But those firms don't really seem to need the money. They need the demand. <laughs> they need it, what you're saying, the demand to come from the economy, and then they can run. Um, right. It's the small firms that need both. They need the lending and the, and the demand, both. Right. Well, the PPP, I, I think you're right. I think a firm that isn't, doesn't have demand, they can't really take out a loan to pay their workers for a period and then have to pay the loan back because they'll never be able to pay that loan back. It doesn't make the any PPP sense. was structured so that if they used it to pay your workers, it got forgiven. Right. So it turned into a grant. Right. But I think it's that's a really hard marketing challenge to tell firms that they're have it struggling to figure out what's going on. Take out this loan and trust us; it'll be forgiven. You won't have to pay it back. Yeah. I think we needed to have a program that didn't look like a loan to get a lot more a lot more businesses to take it up. Yeah, no, I I, I agree. It's I mean the Fed has been trying very hard to 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 work on a variety of ways to try to make it easier for state and local governments to borrow, make it easier for small businesses or medium-sized businesses to borrow. But again, the state of demand for the businesses, I think is the constraining factor. I, I do agree with that. Um, I think that's right. So, um, and many of these businesses, until we can get the virus under control, there's just no way they're going to have demand. If you're a local health club, nobody's coming there until, until the virus is under control. Um, and so to get the jobs back, we really need to, to get the virus under control. So, this is an interesting, I mean, I, again, I was just in a conversation today about this with a, one of the governor's task forces uh, is on small business. California has uh, among the, the strictest restrictions in the country on this whole personal service issue. I guess one of the things we as economists might want to ask ourselves is to what extent as this lingers and lingers, the economic cost of those restrictions is getting much bigger because 
you're running the risk that these will just disappear. They're, they're going to go away. They're, they can't survive anymore. They might have survived for two or three months. They can survive for six or seven months. So do you think economists are doing enough to assess the, the economic costs of the health restrictions? That's a really big question. And again, an unfair question, but I, I think economists almost have to, we have to ask ourselves now, are we doing this right? Yeah. Well, let me take on a piece of that question and I'll try to kind of come out to the bigger piece. One of the things you see is if you look across states and you compare the states that imposed the order, shut down orders early versus were later to do it or didn't do it at all, or, or they lifted them early versus not, you don't see that much difference between those states in the amount of demanded small businesses or the kind of speed of the collapse or the amount of, of job loss. Okay. It looks like the job loss was driven by people, the customers went away. And the customers didn't go away because the governor told them to. The customers went away because they thought it wasn't safe to go to the business anymore. Right, right. And so I, I think that fo think, framing it in terms of are these restrictions causing trouble, I think that's probably not going to make that much of a difference to, to change the restrictions. You have to make people feel safe. And, you have, and to make people feel safe, you have to make them safe. So, you know, the kind of analogy to the colleges that are trying to open up in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. College, they're trying to open up. The governor's not telling them they can't but they can't open up because the minute they open up, they have these outbreaks. Yeah. I think it, the reality is we have to get the virus under control. And unless we do, it doesn't really matter what, what public health orders we put in place. To, and of course, that of goes to your point about we fail to use the time to develop the capabilities, in particular, the testing capabilities to, uh, to do this. So now it, it, it's so, it's so uh, widespread in so many places that even if you could deliver all the tests, which you can, you can't track either because it's in the community. And so tracking in a particular place doesn't, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. So yeah, that is a, a real tragedy. On um, the issue, go ahead. If tomorrow we could get the testing and the infrastructure in place to do this right, then we could have a, a two week hard shutdown again. Yes. Knowing that we could then open up afterward and use the testing and tracing to be able to keep the virus under control yes, after yes, that. Yes, just that's but exactly. we're so we're no closer to having the testing in place now than we were four months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, um, let me ask about the your your point about the recovery of demand is a very important one that I that I think uh, people should should hear that actually a lot of the recovery of demand. Uh, there were two issues there. One is uh, where was the in additional income going? So in lower income households, you can see what we talked about earlier, which is almost all of that income is spent. Yeah. And it's spent uh, on lo locally and it's spent on essentials. And to the extent that you can also now do more del digital delivery service, it's spent through digital delivery, but still it's spent. Whereas upper income groups are not spending in part because they are, they're not convinced that the, the health risk of going to spend is, is contained. So I think that's a very important point. Um, it links to another point, thinking about the recovery of leisure and um, sports facilities and things like that. I, it's hard to imagine that we see a lot of big conferences going on in New York or San Francisco. All of those conference centers, all of those hotels, all of those big venues for entertainment where essentially I would say over several months or maybe at least until a widespread vaccine uh, is available and safe, it's hard to see those coming back. I, I don't know. I, I worry a lot about that. I, I wonder how you feel about that. I, mean, I think that's right. I think until until the virus is under much, much better control than we can even see in the near in the foreseeable future here. I don't see a lot of people going to movie theaters or or voluntarily getting on airplanes or going to concerts or things like that. So I think that those those are going to be that's going to be a long time to recover. That said, in the countries that have done a good job on the public health response, have, have gotten things under control, they are able to open things up safely because they have the prevalence rate so low that it's not a big risk and they yeah. know who has it. Yeah. And we're just not there. And it's, it's a it was a federal responsibility and the federal government just completely dropped the ball. 
I heard a, a very interesting, I mean, so we, we haven't talked about schools, although you did mention that one of the very big colleges in the country was open for a week and just announced it's closing. Uh, we heard today an announcement, but not with much detail about a major new testing capability they're introducing in Los Angeles to try to handle getting kids back to school. Yeah. Um, testing has been widely used in the school systems in Europe. Uh, I was listening to a, a conversation today about Denmark. I mean, essentially, you, you, you put kids in a room, there's 25 kids, they stay together the whole time in the school with the teacher. If there's an outbreak, and they, they're testing all the time, if there's an outbreak, they're going to find it right away and contain it right away. So they, they both contain the group, and then they actually test uh, rigorously and often. Right. Right. And if you go back and you look at those plans that the colleges were putting out a couple of months ago about how they were going to reopen this fall, all of them talked about how they were going to be testing constantly. Right. You started to wonder how much how much college students were going to tolerate putting things up their noses to test them. But they were going to do it every week or every two weeks. And that's a fine thing to, to plan for, but we just don't have the capacity to do it. Nobody has the has the ability to do that many tests. It's really unfortunate because, yeah, anyway. Well, listen, I've, 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 I've unfairly taken you far afield, Jesse, but I know that you're a brilliant economist, so I know that you can both talk about <laughs> the labor market and other issues. Before you go, just tell uh, the audience a little bit about the California Policy Lab. What, what, how is it funded and what is its, its mission for, for California? Sure. The Policy Lab is a joint uh, uh, effort of a team here at Berkeley and one at UCLA, and we're bringing in people from around the, uh, the rest of the University of California to really form partnerships with state and local governments in California to help them make better use of their data to, to serve the public good. And so we're working on joint, pro joint research projects with a number of different agencies, helping them curate their administrative data, helping them use it to understand what works and what doesn't, and to design better programs. Oh, that's fantastic. That's wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm sure we'll all come and try to use your data. <laughs> we'll come up with really good questions and come to you. All right. Well, I want to thank you very much, Jesse, for taking time to share your insights with us. And I want to thank Berkeley Haas for starting this uh, lecture series, right now a webinar series on pandemic business economics and inclusion. Uh, and everyone have a very good day. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks for having me.